what would you say, just I guess on, a, on another topic, what would you say was the uh, the biggest success story with this campaign? I mean, this is I guess, I, yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's very difficult. It's when a candidate comes from nowhere to get 47% of the vote. I mean, this is a real head scratch, I don't know. But, uh, you, know, I, you know, beyond that, I guess, I mean, we can talk about Brian Bowman, obviously, but I mean, what else would you point to? Would you say, you know, really, I mean, this was a, what was the major success story that sort of really came out of this campaign? There it is. Um, I think the obvious ones, and I hope somebody else can talk about these, Robert Falcon to let Brian Bowman. So I'm going to pick a less obvious one, um, Sean Dobson, who's the new uh, St. Charles councillor. He's run four times. He's um, talked about grinding it out. Um, this was his fourth race. He beat Grant Nordman um, in, a, in a, quite decisively, in a basically a three, maybe three, maybe four way race in that uh, ward. Usually it's a really boring ward and on election night it's, um, it was really quite, it was quite a nasty race. And that's the perseverance argument, I think, in politics. People, they finally knew his name. He's not maybe necessarily the most, he's not a perfect candidate. He's not, you know, he's not a big fancy lawyer or anything like that. Um, and I don't know what kind of counselor he'll be, but I actually admire the guy who puts his name on the ballot four times and defeats an incumbent counselor, which is really hard to do. And doesn't ha it happened twice, at least twice, with two, yeah. two, yeah, that's right, this time. And, but it's hard to do. So, Sean Dobson, success story. Yeah. No, that's a really good example, and I think that race really flew under the radar in terms of the ones that people were looking at in terms of which council seats might flip. I mean, that was one that was kind of like, oh yeah, you know, that one. Um, you know, the, and I, I think the other one I would point to as well is I mean, Debbie Sharma also losing, almost losing, yeah. in, uh, in Old Kildonan as well. Um, Royce, what would you say? What would you say is the biggest success story that you came out of well, from the last night? If we're not talking about Bowman, then it's... Well, we can talk about Bowman. Well, Bowman had some great success. So, okay, there you go. Um, but for for Ulat, uh, I, I thought uh, for someone who's only lived in Winnipeg for three years now, uh, had zero name recognition when this race started. I can hardly find anyone that has a negative thing to say about him. I think he distinguished himself. It's pretty clear that he's going to be running for office again uh, in the near future. And uh, I thought the idea that he beat Gord Steves is uh, unbelievable. Experience and name recognition that Gore Steves has to be to have for to have him like him. That's a real, real achievement. So that is very clearly a success story, and that's the way his uh, his party looked last night too. They were very happy for a candidate that came in third place. Yeah, it really, it really is remarkable, and, and uh, you know, for to have him uh, have him come along and do that. You know, I thought when the sort of suggestion was in play that perhaps the race was going to be really tight between Judy and Brian. I thought, you know, to some extent, because that maybe some of Robert Falk and Alette's support would actually collapse and people go, you know what, I'm going to, you know, I, I was thinking about him, I think he's a great candidate, but you know what, I, I should probably vote for Judy just so the right of center guy doesn't get in. And, uh, and that didn't happen. I mean, that clearly didn't happen uh, with, uh, with you know, the way that uh, he was able to end up finishing a strong third. Yeah, he attracted strong support. Uh, and then other people say, well, maybe he should just run for council before he went through the, uh, the big enchilada. Well, well, Bowman went right from there, and he won his first try. Why could Dillette try it? Gina, you know, what would you say was the biggest success story? I'll just say something about Robert. I mean, I think he ran an interesting campaign, but I, I actually think he was propelled into third by, by a bit of luck. And when you had uh, Paula's campaign that just evaporated, she should have been much further ahead, if, if you think about the start of the race. And obviously Steve's just kind of falling apart as well. So he kind of got a free ride into a few of the votes because there just was not really... After uh, Judy and, and uh, Brian, that was it. The rest of the campaign seemed to drop off, and Ouellette was kind of the third kind of choice, in a way. Again, not taking any way, I thought he ran a really interesting campaign, but I think it was, you know, a little bit of luck on his part, and I think a little bit of luck on Bowman's part in the end, where just a whole bunch of things came together, and it was kind of like this, this up the middle. Uh, the other thing I was just going to highlight is, uh, you know, Cindy uh, Gilroy and in, uh, in Anarski. Is that it? Dynamite, Dynamite, uh, knocking off, uh, you know, Harvey, and and I know that they've been knocking on that door for many years, and Harvey's always uh, risen to the challenge, and, and it's kind of good and bad, you know. I know there was some uh, some folks that wanted to see Harvey go. They thought, you know, he'd been there too long, and but I, I give the guy credit. He was somebody who answered the phone. He seemed to work hard. He was an interesting guy. Uh, I talked to him all the time about politics, and uh, but it was a bit of a tough race there. And I worked with uh, Keith Bellamy for a couple of years, and it seemed to be a nice uh, three-way race. Uh, 
you know, somebody was giving away fruit, somebody was giving away chocolate, <laughs> there was a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, you had a, a kind of a good race there. Well, I gotta tell you, if someone dropped a banana on my doorstep, I might be inclined to vote for them. You never know. Uh, but, I, but I think, uh, you know, I think that's a good point. And uh, that's, a, that's a good one to point to. And I think it's really interesting, too, is the fact that, I mean, how often has it happened where you've not just had two candidates having a rematch, but three candidates having yeah, a rematch, and a different outcome, because yeah. in 2010, yeah, Harvey Smith, Keith Bellamy, Cindy Gilroy were all on the ballot. Harvey pulled through this time, you know, similar dynamic, and uh, and it was Cindy Gilroy Price who ended up, or Cindy Gilroy ended up uh, taking it. So it's, uh, yeah, that's a really, uh, you know, I, I thought it was just kind of a fascinating, because basically that's almost been like a five-year-long campaign. And then the other one, just very quickly, was the, uh, Thomas Steen, you know, he was a, you know, we got the Jets back, maybe then we got the Jets back, you know, he's, uh, his name kind of just fell off, and I know he's had a few other things going on, but a bit of a surprise there, maybe or maybe not. Yeah, kind of the Jets versus the, uh, you know, the old guard of the Schreier name. So, but that was an interesting. Uh, I, I wasn't surprised by that. Um, I, I mean, Thomas Dean seemed like he really didn't have, to me, a very strong campaign, and uh, and uh, and I think that uh, you know J Jason Schreier I mean, is just very organized, and uh, um, you know, I, I I was one of the people who actually got the the, the robocall from from Bobby Hall, you know. <laughs> or go out and uh, go and vote for Thomas. And, uh, I don't. You know, I, 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 obviously, yeah, obviously, the, you know, for people in L1 EK that, that didn't have uh, you know the Golden Jet didn't have too much uh, appeal. Yeah. Um, I'm done. Done. Yeah. Okay. Next. Next topic. Most overlooked story. What would you say? You know, in terms of all of the all of the stories or all of the uh, the things that we talked about in this campaign, and obviously we talked about a lot. What was one thing that you would say that was uh, was overlooked? What would, you, what would you point to saying, you know, this is something that really we probably should have been talking about, but uh, we didn't. I mean, Mary, Mary Angus uh, had a point about some of the things that we did talk about that we normally don't talk about, like indigenous issues and poverty, but what did what did we miss? What, what, what was missing from the, the agenda? I'm really not sure what the answer is. I mean, when you have a hundred debates from the cover of those topics, can I take a pass? Sure. <laughs> sure. Do you know? What would you say was the most overlooked thing? You know, I mean, in a broader sense, what I thought was being missed are, are some of the really interesting de debates and battles at, at the council level that we seem so focused on who's going to be mayor, we kind of forgot about all the support that mayor needs. And when the coverage keeps going to who's in first and who's in second or whose campaign has been obliterated by comments and scandal and all the rest, we fought, we forgot about all these really unique uh, fights that were going on. and, and and getting some people out. Um, last night, you know, I was on a Winnipeg Free Press panel, having fun at the Free Press Cafe. Two plugs for you. And uh, somebody mentioned, uh, you know, the gender issue. That you know, um, a lot of the wards were all male. We didn't have a, a, a you know, representation from uh, some new Canadians, uh, others on council. So, so you know, we, I would have liked to have seen kind of a, a bit more of a diverse kind of mix, a bit of a discussion of that, and um, and certainly a bit more discussion at the council level. Yeah, no, I think that's that's an excellent point, Gino. I mean, you know, the, the focus. I mean, in some ways, the way I think that the the, the story, you know, the, the sort of story ends up being about the uh, you know when the, the mayoral candidates are promising all kinds of things, left, right, and center. I almost think like every story or every press release that a candidate issues or every story about those announcements should say, you know, in big asterisk at the bottom, subject to getting nine votes on council. Yeah, yeah. Because really, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, these. These folks can promise the, the moon, they can say that they're already, you know, they can say they're going to cancel bus rapid transit, or they can say that they're going to put their line over here, or they're going to do this, and they're going to do that. But right. at the end of the day, I mean, if they don't have, if they don't have those votes on council, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not, necessarily, uh, not necessarily relevant. What would you say was the most overlooked story? Um, I just want to say, first, I totally agree with Gino. We didn't cover the wards enough. Um, and they were, those stories were shoehorned in at the last minute out of, like, in a desperate panic because we just didn't have time and we didn't have space and TV didn't do any better and there was interesting stuff happening that we just, we knew we weren't getting to them and, um, and we should have, so yeah, totally agree. Um, and some of those races were just like messy, God, like they were fun, they would have been really fun to write about and so yeah, so fair point. Um, and now I'm gonna steal Colin Fast's uh, uh, missed thing um, about police. I just outed him, now he's gonna, yeah. Um, uh, Colin mentioned on Twitter not long ago, and I 100% agree with it, that one um, issue we have not talked about is the emergency services budget, particularly police, I think. Um, we did not talk at all about, do we need as many police officers as we have? Um, the number goes up 
incrementally every year. It's the biggest part of uh, the city budget. Um, uh, I actually think we need more paramedics and probably fewer firefighters, but we can't even talk about that in the city. We can certainly not talk about it during a campaign when you've got firefighter endorsements and um, and Tina Fontaine has just been killed and you know we, we did not have really a fulsome discussion about um, what we really expect in a police service and 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 whether with crime on a long-term decline if we're if we're doing policing right in the city and that's so I totally credit Colin for raising that and uh, we, and it's something we should have actually asked the candidates um, in the campaign and it just it didn't just didn't come up and no candidate was going to touch it, so that's my, and Collins, his first, I credit him, uh, uh, missed opportunity, I think. Yeah, yeah, most overlooked story. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's an excellent, uh, excellent point. Uh, it is something, I mean, we talked a lot about infrastructure and transportation and all these sorts of things, but uh, yeah, when you look at the budget, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's where the, that's where the costs increase. I mean, I've heard people say that, you know, generally in North America, like police, Cost, it's sort of it's it's the municipal health care like the whole idea of provincial budgets always go up and up and up for for health care with uh, with police is the same thing I, I guess the one thing I would kind of ask sort of spinning out of that though is though when you have and I mean I don't, the the police were not the, the, the police were kind of active in the campaign in 2010 they endorsed Sam Cates they weren't really I don't think very active in terms of endorsement this time but but, but the firefighters of course certainly certainly were. I mean, is it, is it just one of those things I just, I mean, no candidate is willing to touch it, or...? Well, and all you have to do to get the Police Association active is say you might want to cut the police budget. So then you're in a world of trouble, um, I think, as a candidate. So, so and I mean, and it's, it's not like the question hasn't been asked before. Um, we, you know, we asked Devon Clunas in a press conference not, I guess, a year ago, um, whether he thought he needed more officers given the the crime's going down, and he said, actually, we probably don't. We need crime analysis, we need data people, we need, you know, he didn't make the big, uh, strong arm pitch for more officers, which was kind of surprising. So, so it's not like that issue isn't out there, but to, it's kind of, to touch it in a campaign is, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, sort of the third row. Uh, Royce, you said you had a, an overlooked story that you wanted to, uh, to mention. Yes, it seems derivative from Gino's answer about school board races. Um, if anyone here follows me on Twitter, I know a few people do, uh, you know, I had a lot of fun in this campaign watching school board uh, races, and there was a lot of interesting ones, but besides uh, the free press's, as you can see, Nick, Nick Martin. Nick Martin writes uh, wonderful columns about uh, uh, school board, school board's races. They're a little edgy, they're a little cranky, but that's okay. <laughs> they deserve the treatment, but besides, uh, besides Nick, uh, the only real coverage of these races is in the really idiosyncratic cases, such as the social, socially conservative candidate in uh, Louis Real, Real uh, Board 4, I think, Candace Maximovich, who actually came in last place in her board uh, last night. I didn't see any, she got a lot of coverage during the campaign, but I didn't see any reporting of the result in her ward. Uh, so yeah, this is school board cases. Yeah, no, and, and, and the, the thing is too, I, I guess, you know, there are so many, there, there, Winnipeg is unique, I think, compared to a lot of other cities, like you compare us to like Calgary, for example, I mean, we have Toronto, and we only have, we have all these school boards, and all these wards, and all these candidates, and, and, I, and sometimes, I mean, I really do wonder, I mean, how, how well do people know the people who are running for school trustee, and like you say, it's, you know, sort of an example of, um, uh, you know, where, where people are, you know, the, the, you know, sort of, Certain cases, like you know, with uh, Candace Maximovich, uh, you know, being you know, being sort of the, the exception, not the rule, in terms of what people are covering. But I mean, the taxation power of uh, school boards is, is huge. It's, it's actually, if you add it all together, it's actually bigger. Than, I think it's actually the budget would be bigger than what the city spends. So I mean, it has a real impact in terms of you know, not only you know what people are paying on the property tax every year, but uh, uh, you know, education and everything like that. So. And with that power in mind, if you actually look at the results, it seems to me the big story is that incumbents totally clean up in school board races. They use their name recognition and they totally win. Uh, so I think that's the big story that came out last night as well. Yeah. No, I was just going to add to that. I mean, around the water cooler, usually it's somebody's just spinning the wheel on the election thing on the uh, on the trustees and they just, they just guess because there just isn't a whole lot of traction on issues. Unless you get somebody with a bit of name recognition who's like pounding on doors. And this year, in my neighborhood, actually, I thought for the first time we actually had a few trustees making a bit of an effort with some signs, but there's been a few years I just scratched my head. I 
I just look at the, I, I've got kids now, there'd be a couple years I'd look at the names and go, and just put a dot, you know, so uh, it's a tough one. And without, you know, coverage and support, they kind of fade to black, but again, the power that they wield and the fact that we have so many school boards and, and uh, a huge amount of money going there, you'd think we'd give it a bit more uh, treatment. Yeah. Maybe I, some do. Uh, I, I, I admit I, I did the same thing when I cut down to the, the bottom of the ballot and the school trustees had to be, had to be marked off. Do you want to, anything else you want to add on this? Um, only a, maybe a sad reflection on this fact. Um, I did a story earlier this week about Aboriginal candidates. And I miss, I got an email from Nick Martin, who really does know everything there is to know about school boards and school trustee races. And he sent me an email saying, you missed two they're running for school trustee, didn't you read my story about them? And I had to say, no, I, I didn't, because I, I, as, even as a highly politically engaged uh, journalist, person, I don't care about school trustees. And I, if I don't care, the editors don't care, the readers don't care, why do we have so many of them? And I constantly harp on this, like, I grew up in Edmonton where there's one school board and it is, it, is, it is ridiculous that we have the system we have in Winnipeg. And it breeds that kind of contempt and disinterest, I think. Yeah, I guess that would probably be, the, that'll be a debate we'll have to have maybe during the next provincial yeah. election, because I guess they would actually have the power to do anything about that. Um, you know, the one thing I guess, I mean, it's in, it, I know we're here tonight to talk about the Winnipeg um, election and what happened in Winnipeg, but I mean, if I have sort of, you know, one personal pet peeve that, you know, you'll allow me to indulge for just a second about uh, overlooked stories, there's hardly any, there's, there's hardly any coverage or mention or discussion about any of the races happening, um, you know, outside of the city. You know, I'm, I'm from Brandon, so I mean, I, that's why, you know, that's, that's my bias showing. But, uh, but I mean, you know, one of the things I thought was actually very interesting is, I mean, the, you know, the talk about the capital, the, the capital region, for example. Half the Reeves in the capital region were tons of people who work, you know, in these different RMs kind of around the city. Uh, you know, they tons of people live out there and, and, and work in the city and, and do things in the city. Half of the Reeves in, in these R, RMs in the capital region actually turned over last night. New, all the brand new, brand new people that are now leading those things. And, you know, I think in terms of like regional planning and everything like that, I mean, that's, uh, you know, in terms of Winnipeg, you know, there's issues with its infrastructure, issues with sprawl, everything like that. I think that's a big deal, and I think some of the issues of, you know, some of the local issues in those areas are really, I think, you know, important and probably deserve more focus. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you've got to go back to Glenn Murray when he actually put regional planning on the map and, and formed the capital region, uh, the mayors and reeves of the capital region, to get people talking about coordination uh, within the capital region, thinking about urban sprawl, thinking about development and transportation and uh, ecosystems. And if you go back to around the early 2000s, we actually spent a fair amount of time and a lot of that material was being filtered down by the provincial government, who also had an interest. And then I think it just kind of faded away. So I, I too am surprised, you know. I know there's still a loose coalition of mayors and reeves that kind of sort of talk about the capital region in a, in a broad economic sense about coordination and cooperation, but uh, definitely uh, didn't really come up at all. 